afternoon and welcome back to KW Property Management and Consulting's Community Association Best Practices Monthly Webinar Series. I'll be your host, Tim O'Keefe, an Executive Director and Partner with KW Property Management and Consulting. In late May, the state legislature in Florida finally came back together for a special session and specifically addressed residential building safety, an issue that we thought would have been taken care of in the initial session this year. But the governor asked the uh, legislature to come back and address it because they didn't. So the special session was a result of the Champlain Tower South tragedy. And last month, almost exactly one year to the day that the building collapsed, a judge ruled on the Champlain Towers lawsuit and awarded estates and families of the property nearly a billion dollars for their losses and damages. So it was a miraculous uh, effort on behalf of the judge to get all this done in a year's time. Uh, this new legislation that we're going to talk about today is getting a lot of attention and rightfully so. It's important for community associations to understand the new legal requirements for buildings and uh, the inspections and to keep the property safe as well as the financial impact the law will have to properly fund the reserves for the buildings. Today, we have a terrific panel going to address the new laws and to answer as many of your questions that we can get through regarding these new legal requirements. Uh, we do have poll questions that you'll see on your screen. Please feel free to respond to those poll questions. We'll review those about halfway through uh, the, uh, the event today. So let me introduce our outstanding panelists today, starting with David Haber. David, David is the founder of his firm, Haber Law. He has more than 30 years of experience representing clients in community association law, construction law, complex commercial disputes, real estate, and business law. David always does a great job in our webinars, and we will learn a great deal from him. So David, thanks for joining us today. Well, uh, thank you for having me, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. My pleasure. Uh, Sammy Haddam is a licensed mechanical engineer and project manager for Epic Forensics and Engineering, focused on construction defect analysis, condition assessments, and expert representation from high rises to large scale HOA marina and marinas. Welcome, Sammy. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And Bruce Mejia is a regional vice president and partner with KW Property Management and Consulting. Bruce has a construction background, and his portfolio of properties with KW includes dozens of properties that have gone through 40-year recertification processes. So Bruce will have a lot to say about this from a practical point of view. Bruce has joined me on several webinars in the past, so thanks, Bruce, and welcome back. Thanks for having me, Tim. Pleasure to be here with Sammy and uh, David as well. Awesome. David, let me start with you. So we want to talk about the new laws that went into effect. So we now know that the state legislature finally addressed the highly anticipated laws throughout Florida to make our residential buildings safer. Can you discuss just from a global standpoint what the new laws now address? Yeah, I mean, obviously Champlain Towers had numerous issues that have been documented in the press. There was the allegation that the neighboring building caused issues. There's Obviously, the report that was issued over two and a half years before the building collapsed, saying that there were structural issues that needed to be addressed right away. Um, they didn't get addressed because um, they didn't have adequate reserves and they couldn't agree on how big the assessment would be and how they were going to pass it, how they were going to get approval, this, that, and the other. There were a lot of politics. I had been advocating for the last year until this uh, session passed the law to get rid of the politics of reserves. It is very hard to be on a board and tell people that you're going to raise millions of dollars in reserves and cause them to have financial stress. But the flip side of that coin is if you don't, you're gonna have monstrous special assessments down the line, especially on older buildings with huge pool decks, parking decks and the like. The legislature, took heed of the advice of the uh, law panel, uh, as well as many of us in the industry, and got rid of the discretion to waive reserve starting in 2024. That is a huge change in the law. It's the first time it's happened. It also got rid of the developer on a, on a turnover building to waive reserves prior to turnover, which I had also advocated getting rid of that, and the reason for that is you don't want the building starting out three years behind the eight ball when it gets turned over. Oh, by the way, you haven't had reserves for three years. It's a terrible way to start a project uh, when it gets turned over. So there's no more waiver of reserves. 
the days of kicking the can down the road are over for everyone, which is really wonderful news, taking the discretion out of the hands of lay people boards that are subject to the whims of politics and who's gonna get on the board. The other thing is that instead of a 40 year certification, you now have to have a report done after 25 years if you're within three miles of the coastline. That's bay, that's ocean. That is where the major corrosion is occurring on these concrete and steel buildings. And this is a why I had advocated for 15 years, but 25 is okay too. And 30 years if you're not on the coastline. And then every five years thereafter. And that is going to mean that people like Sammy are going to be even busier than they are now. So you need to schedule your inspections uh, through the Bruce's of the world to get to the Sammy's of the world to get these inspections done for life safety components. And of course, the third thing, which is equally important, is those reports then get delivered to the building official. And that is critical because the building official is the person charged with life safety for the community. And when that person gets that report, trust me, they're not going to do what the official did in Surfside, which is let it get slow played. They're going to go to the engineer and the board and say, show me your plan for remediation now. And if you don't jump on that remediation plan, they're going to threaten to close down your building, red tag your building and make your residents leave if they feel there's any risk of safety violation because they don't want death on their hands. And they're not going to put up with what has happened for many, many years, which is, and Tim and T Tim and Bruce know this for sure, which is people in their 47th year, and they still haven't finished their 40-year certification. So I'll stop there. Well, there there's a, that's a great overview, David. And there's a whole lot to unpack from that. So let's start unpacking some of this. So there's, as I understand it, there's two phases of inspections that need to take place. And, and Sammy, I'll come to you with the first question. So there's something called the milestone report that needs to get done. So from an engineer standpoint, can you discuss what is the milestone report? So the milestone report as required by this new legislation is a structural assessment, effectively. I, we have to, we're gonna have to evaluate the structure of the building going from the foundation, load bearing walls, the roof, any other structural components and affect and do, do an evaluation, figure out if there are any components which are going to need repair and perform any destructive testing that may be needed. So that's going to be a very thorough evaluation and it's going to be uh, very critical in maintaining the health of these buildings. So I think it's very important that this legislation got passed and I'm very happy that it got passed because the community is in danger as, as a result. If, if these buildings don't get evaluated regularly, we all are in danger. And so David, one of the questions that was asked uh, prior to uh, this session was whether or not the, 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 the you talk about the distance being within the milestone reports got to get done. and there's, you have to be within three miles of coastline. Is that, the, the question was, is that three miles or three nautical miles? You know, that they, ha they have not, um, you know, that's where the division of administrative hearings and the division of condominiums are gonna have to promulgate rules. Typically the legislature passes this, you know, what we call higher level legislation and then the details get filled in by the executive department, which in this case would be the division of condominiums. I can't tell you, I don't, I don't recall whether it's three nautical miles or whether it's three linear miles. Um, I don't remember. And then there's, you know, there's this great question is what if you're on a monstrous lake near Lake Okeechobee? What happens, th what happens there? Or what if you're in, you know, St. Pete Bay up the river? Um, so, uh, that's going to be a question that's going to have to be uh, fleshed out. Um, and the other thing, David, to talk about the how, how does the building size matter? Is this for all buildings or buildings over a certain? Level? I think it's buildings over two or three stories. Um, it's 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 pretty much everybody. There, there's this was a a swift reaction to two things. One, 
Surfside, and two, having done nothing about Surfside in the regular legislative session mm -hmm. and getting crushed by the media for not having done anything and crushed by the citizenry for not having done anything. They had no choice but to do something and they passed what I would call very black and white rules. I agree with the rules, uh, but you know, for some people it came as a huge shock that they were gonna do this. But you know, sometimes even though the medicine doesn't kill you, the medicine hurts. And this is medicine that tastes bad, you know, for a lot of people. And, and a lot of people with older buildings that haven't been reserving or been partial reserving for the last 10 or 20 or 30 years, this is a huge problem now. And there's going to, and Bruce and you can talk about the funding issues that are going to come into play. You're talking about having to fund millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, it is a big deal. And by the way, I, I, I want to add one other thing, which is reserve studies. Um, you got to have reserve studies now. It's not like you can wait five years to get a reserve study. And so that the people on this call know there is a huge change in the cost of materials over the last two and a half years since COVID. And I mean huge, like Trump huge. It's big. Um, you're talking about double the cost of materials for concrete, for steel. And Sammy can talk about this. And labor has gone through the roof in terms of labor costs. So when you go to a remediation company, whichever one of the five or 10 companies that are approved by KW as their, you know, what you would call special approved vendors, you're gonna find that something that cost $5 million four years ago is now nine or 10 million. And that is separate from the additional corrosion that may have occurred which, as I've discussed previously with Ben Messerschmidt of Epic, is what we would call exponential corrosion. And I'd like Sammy to talk about that. What that means from a lawyer's point of view or a layman's person's point of view is a million dollars worth of damage today, 18 months later, could be seven million. In, in other words, it's not like it's incremental. It can go up very exponentially quickly as the damage happens. And Sammy can talk more about that. So uh, just a little clarification, the, uh, the legislation requires uh, milestone studies and uh, reserve studies for buildings three stories or higher. So the- Condos and co-ops. Correct, correct. All residential living, multi-family multi residential living facilities. Right. So, for as far as exponential cor corrosion goes, uh, let's take an example of a crack in a wall. So you have a small crack in a wall, very easy to repair, very quick repair, very cheap repair. But if it doesn't get repaired in a reasonable amount of time, those cracks get bigger and bigger and bigger. And now you have, especially for buildings on the coast, you have water, you have salt water getting into that crack and going past the waterproofing into the concrete and then eventually attacking the reinforcement behind it. Once that reinforcement gets corroded, it starts corroding further and further and scaling. Now it's pushing the concrete out and undermining the structural integrity of that, of that component, whether it be a wall, a column, whatever the case is. So now your repair has gone from a simple have to repair for a crack to now you're looking at shoring you're looking at massive amounts of concrete excavation you're looking at rebar replacement and uh, the reapplication of the concrete as well as the stucco as well as water any waterproofing as well as paint so attacking these problems early is is the cheapest option for these buildings and the best option you want to attack these problems early rather than later because it's only going to get worse. And that's what we actually were three months last uh, fall where David, Bruce and Ben and I had a conversation about building maintenance and preventative maintenance and the importance of it and why Champlain Towers had the problem that they had because they just for 40 years, they ignored the fact that they had preventive maintenance issues and Look, when the building's brand new, it doesn't need those things. But if you don't set money aside and you don't start 
an effective preventive maintenance plan, you end up having significant costs and problems after 20, 30, 40 years. And basically that's what you're talking about, Sammy, is the, the need and the necessity for making sure that you're properly, main, you're properly maintained the building with the proper funds available for it. Correct. So, so Sam, I just want to get back to the milestone report because there's two different kinds. There's two, there's three different components to this law from my perspective. There's a milestone report, which you explained is the visual inspection. There's the structural integrity uh, report, and then there's a structural integrity reserve study. We'll talk about the reserve study. We'll get into that. But what is the difference between the milestone report and the structural integrity report that could be done? So the structural integrity report is really the milestone report. The milestone report has two phases, phase one, phase two. Phase one is your visual observation that the engineer, perform, engineer or architect performs. And at that point, we're identifying any potential issues. And phase two is destructive testing. When the engineer or architect is performing the uh, phase one milestone inspection, you're looking at any cracks any spalling, any potential issues with the building, and we would assign a lifespan for that repair and a cost associated, but that comes further along in the reserve study. Really, the purpose of that milestone study is just to identify the issue. And sometimes these issues, it may seem benign, but we will have to do destructive testing in order to really understand what this issue is. So we may see a small portion of concrete popping off a building, at which point we're going to have to start digging in to see the extent of corrosion behind it or to see if there's any post-tensioning issues behind it. So, so it's, it's a two-phase process. Some buildings may only need that phase one process. If we don't see, any, if we don't see anything that is going to require any destructive testing, we don't have to, we don't have to perform that. But... Uh, I'm sorry. The other thing I was going to say was for pre turnover, the developer has to provide a milestone inspection um, report and for post turnover condos and co-ops um, for COs that were issued before 1992, there has to be an initial milestone report due by December 31, 2024. So for older buildings, you have to have it done in basically uh, two years and six months, five and a half months. It has 2020, to be. 2024. So yep. If you had a reserve study done in your building, let's say this year, earlier this year, that doesn't count. That's a reserve study. It's that doesn't that, count. It's not the same. The structural, structural report, the milestone structural report is for load bearing wall, structural members and structural systems sealed by a licensed architect or engineer. A reserve study can be done by a reserve study specialist who is not an architect or engineer. And therefore the reserve study is not the same as the milestone inspection report. Um, and then if a building had a CO issued after July 1, 1992, the milestone inspection report uh, is due by December 31st of the 25th year of the building uh, within three miles and 30 years if it's not within three miles. And then every 10 years thereafter, not every five. Um, now here's the, the other kicker. You have to give the enforcing agency, which is the building department, a copy of the report within six months. I would suggest you give it to them immediately. The other thing is, if you don't give it to them and you're a board member, it's considered willful and knowing failure. Now, why does willful matter as a matter of law? What is the impact of willful? You have impunity and protection from personal liability under the 617.0832, which is the nonprofit statute for actions as a board member in your business judgment, so long as it is not criminal, intentional, willful. The minute you do something that is willful, you can have personal liability. So it's not just a breach of fiduciary duty for which the association can get sued. 
It is a breach of fiduciary to which I argue you can definitely be personally sued because it is considered willful and knowing failure if you don't get that report mm -hmm. done. You also must post that report physically on site and provide a copy of that ins milestone inspection to every unit owner, regardless of whether the findings are good or bad. You also have to provide the timelines for when you're going to do the work. You must provide that when you give them the report. That's why you get six months because you have to come up with a plan. You don't just get to say, my building is bad. You gotta say, my building is bad and this is how we plan on fixing it. And here are the time frames that we're gonna do this, 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 and this because they want the action plan. So you gotta have your management company and, and, and Bruce and I and Tim have talked about this a hundred times. Get your team together. Get your lawyer, get your engineer or architect, get your you know, management company, get together, come up with your plan. Do not wait until 2024. There won't be an engineer around in 2024 to help you. I can guarantee people are going to be screaming at the last minute, help me, help me, help me. And it's going to be too late. There aren't enough structural engineers and architects in the state of Florida to deal with all the work that there's that there exists. And Bruce can talk about that as well as well. So, as so Tim, I, I figured I would get into the conversation a little bit too, but I, I will let you know that one of those other things that I want to point out that David uh, talked about, it's the reserve specialist also. If you're thinking about getting a, a time slot with a reserve specialist, you're looking at anywhere between eight to 12 months to even get an appointment right now. So if, if you're developing a checklist, if you're a board member and you're developing these checklists, you know, David, I'm also thinking about the, the webinars that, you know, that we've done together. And we talked about the potential of what will come out. And I think we did pretty well of, of you know, kind of, you know, moving down the line and focusing and projecting what would happen. And a lot of the stuff that we've talked about on our webinars, we've done that. But in essence, I could tell you that, you got to get onto the, you know, the bandwagon already, everybody, you know, like David said, those are key things that I believe now that are game changes. Re now having to reserves, which David, you know, I just want to point out, you know, our friends in Tallahassee didn't talk about the levels of reserving. They talked about, you know, maybe you want to bring that out also. Uh, you know, people say, well, what we used to do is we partially reserved. And I want you to maybe address that because you did talk about reserves, which is now, you know, no reserve is off the, you know, off the table. Having a uh, reserve study is on the table. Having an inspection is on the table. So people like Sammy, like he said, you know, are, are extremely busy. They've been busy for the last, you know, two years. So, you know, you know, they've always been swamped because not only is people getting everything together now, but a lot of people are doing work on their associations in general. And the big one, David, is I think people need to start thinking about if they want to be on board of directors, understand the liability that you have now when you take that step of being on a board and how serious it is to be on a board. So you might want to think, you know, hey, understand I've got a fiduciary responsibility now, but I have a, another responsibility that David pointed out. So those were key things that are there. So if I'm developing a checklist, that's a checklist I would put together. And so uh, one of the things that David talked about is ignorance of the law is no excuse. That can be, look, the law has been very clear. There's been a lot of communication. There's a lot of webinars out there. You can't come back at the end of 2024 and say, I didn't know we were supposed to reserve. I didn't know we were supposed to have these studies done. That might be, I'm not a lawyer here, but that might be considered willful. Those days, those days are over. And I, mean, I, would say, I would say this to any one of the board members listening. If you're on a board and your board doesn't take the advice of your lawyer and doesn't take the advice of your engineer and doesn't take the advice of your management company, whether it's to get the reserve study done now and get started, whether it's to start on this initial threshold inspection that has to be done, whether it's to, you know, uh, start reserving, uh, whether it's to increase your insurance to make sure you have adequate insurance for your building, which was a huge issue in Surfside. Whatever the issue is, you better either put in writing that you disagree with what they're doing or you better get off the board. 
The days of sitting around on your hands, finished. You know, David, you know, I want to throw in something there is that I've, I've heard over and over with all these things happening. How are we going to be able to afford this? And, you know, what, what's happening now is that people are paying the price. These are the, this is the price that everyone's paying, especially the older buildings. And, and you know, you, the, it's not going to be a sympathetic situation. So now is the time to start saving the dollars, putting the plan into action, because, you know, going to banks and borrowing money is more expensive today, folks. And, you know, there is more and more requirements that banks have to lending money also in regards to, you know, things of this nature. So there's a lot of things. It's, it's, it's like a, a domino effect that, that's coming in. And yes, it's very expensive now to live in a condominium or an HOA. And yes, the older population is feeling it because they're the fixed income people out there as well, which is very, very difficult now. So now is a time for, as a board to be very sensitive, to put a plan into place or to even be, you know, thinking about a plan, uh, you know, don't wait. You know, if you're going to sit there and on your hands. Let me throw this out at you guys, Bruce and, and David. So James in Miami Beach asked this question ahead of our session today, which is, what do you think about the high cost for owners to borrow funds at prevailing interest rates to cover these reserve, to reserve funding? Uh, but that money gets placed into accounts with no or very low levels of interest. And it sits there for many years. It's like, you know what? That's the cost of living in a condo. And the cost of the not cost. putting money into a program for the last 30 years to keep your building maintained. And if you go back to Champlin Towers, I, David, you probably know better than I do. I think the number that I saw that they needed to spend about $16 million to get the building up mm -hmm. to standard. And they just kept deferring, deferring, deferring until it fell. And they all knew it. They had an engineering study that said the building was compromised and they continued to push it off because there had people have been living there for 35, 40 years on fixed income. And they're, you know, what they said is we couldn't afford it. And nowadays, ladies and gentlemen, you have to be able to afford it. And if you can't, then you have to consider other options for where you're going to live. You know, Tim, my friend sure. David Haber said something. My friend David Haber said something uh, a number of years ago when we were on one of these. And, and I hope he's still fighting for that because, you know, people are having problems borrowing money. And one of the things you said, David, I'm going to remind you and, you know, give you a tickler there is that maybe the state could put some kind of fund together or something of that nature where you said you came out and said, it's going to be difficult. So we're going to have to have the vehicles for people to be able to borrow. That's not out there, but I hope that you know that our politicians are listening to those things and are being sensitive to understand this is going to take money and there are plenty of associations that are very very solvent they're you know they're lucrative they've got money but there are other ones that are very broke that are going to need the help so let me let me try to address that issue because i think that is a really interesting issue Let's compare two associations. They're right next door to each other. They're both 50 years old. They're both huge concrete monolithic structures. They need massive amounts of concrete remediation. One has been reserving all along and people didn't really move into that building because it was more expensive to live in. And the one next door kicked the can down the road and it said, you know, we're not gonna do it. The prices had higher fair market value because people had less monthly burden. Why should the people in building one have to suffer the consequences mm -hmm. of the people in building two being irresponsible financially for the last 30 years? It's a political question that I don't know that it's gonna be answered so quickly. I do believe that the SBA can create a program like they do for hurricane funding for condominiums, which I've advocated that they create a program, federal program to deal with condominiums um, in order to give long-term funding at low interest rates. But make no mistake about it, there are gonna be tremendous numbers of condominium terminations as a result of this new law. Buildings with 20 to $25 million of work to be done are gonna have to evaluate whether to do that work or terminate the condominium and sell to a developer who wants to put up a high rise tower on the ocean or on the bay. 
This is happening as we speak, as the New Yorkers are descending upon our land here in Florida to get into the land of you know, no taxation. Um, this is what's going to happen. And I've actually advocated to lower the termination requirement to 80% or 75% because the truth of the matter is, as a public safety measure, I'd rather see new buildings go up pursuant to the new hurricane code than have old buildings where the people really can't afford to fix it. There's a fight within the building on whether to terminate. All that time that's going by, the crack becomes a major problem, as Sammy was saying. And now the 25 million becomes 40 million and they still haven't fixed it. And now we have a safety issue on our hands. So I think what you're going to see with a lot of these condos is they're going to come to the realization that the developer is going to pay them a lot of money. Of course, the problem with that is where do they move to? Because everything is so expensive. Mm -hmm. Tim, let me try to answer some of these questions. Um, uh, is the coastline of Gulf of Mexico as well as the Atlantic? Yes. Um, then there was another question. Um, how is the problem addressed uh, for construction defects when they were originally built, new buildings, poor materials, deficient construction? The problem is addressed by filing a chapter 558 lawsuit with a firm such as mine using an engineering forensic firm like Epic, where Sammy is, is, is working in order uh, to resolve your problems with the developer. Um, uh, do we know if pooling of reserves will be allowed? That impacts exactly what is meant by fully funding. Well, you have to fully fund for all of the structural and other uh, life safety components. Um, does three stories include parking garage and two floors? One second, David. Going back to that previous question, uh, they are requiring straight line detail. Yeah. Straight yeah. line. And, sure. and, and by the way, the reason why they're using straight line they want to make sure you're not using the money. They don't want you using the money to fix your lobby and furniture up when you should be saving the money for your balconies. Um, and then just for definition of that, David, straight line is specific item that's been identified and money with the amount of money that needs to be funded for that. You can only use the money for that particular item in a pooled environment. You can use it for what the, the multiple items that you have reserves set aside for, but when it's straight line, you can only use those funds for that specific item. Um, David, there was a question. I would asked a question about uh, the tall length or the size of the building. If it's less than three stories, this law doesn't apply to you. That's if you're one or two stories, it doesn't apply. What about HOAs? Do HOA structures require? reserves that's another question that's come up a couple different times i believe they do okay. H a H hoas david uh, under the bill i don't think there's anything covered under the bill but you know correct me if i'm wrong uh i'm trying to look it up right now yeah i i don't recall the hoa covered. having to do that but go ahead tim and, keep... so, and then, while you're looking that up david i want to get back to sammy on a question so sammy we talked about milestone report, the threshold inspection, uh, structural engineer, the structural report. What kind of engineer are you required to hire to do these various, because there's, there's structural, there's electrical. Can one uh, engineer do everything or do you have to hire specific engineers to the need of the property? So <clears throat> usually you would hire a firm which has different specialties they, they have a structural engineer they have a mechanical electrical plumbing engineer uh, and the report that's produced will will be written by the specific engineers for that discipline uh, you know sammy let me just answer yeah. something on there it's it's important tim when you are choosing an engineer there are a lot of engineers out there they're going to say they can do this work and what they're going to do is almost like a chop shop. They're going to chop things and sub it out to different things in the area. You really want to find a firm, like Sammy said, and talk to your management company of doing your diligence where it is a one-stop Charlie. It, it's Everybody's held accountable within the same shop. So this way you have a really clean report. And that would be a recommendation that we would have. So I just wanted to add that, Sammy. And, and Sammy, what would, what's the liability associated with an engineering firm that doesn't comply with the laws or signs off on a report that 
doesn't accurately uh, project what the condition of the building is in. A whole mess of fines and loss of license. You know, an engineer. And a lot of lawsuits. Correct. Absolutely. It's, and that, so that might keep some of the firms from out of state just coming in to try to capture revenue if they don't understand the law and understand Florida uh, properties. Uh, hopefully that'll keep the integrity of what we're doing in the state to be a little bit higher than too. Right. Especially given the fact that we have very unique conditions compared to most other states and our and our building requirements are significantly stricter than most other states as well. Hey, Tim, there was a comment, there was a question by uh, a, a Michael out there, and Sammy was really directed to you. Can the engineer who's overseeing the remediation work issue, the milestone report after the work is concluded, or must you use an independent third party? Uh, larger engineering firms such as us and other engineering firms similar to us, we can handle everything in-house. Uh, we can take you from the milestone to the repair protocols, to the construction management portion of the remediation. So if you have the right engineer, they could issue that milestone report. If you don't, then you're gonna to have to get another party. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, and actually those engineer firms such as us, we can actually do the reserve study as well. So uh, one of the questions was, our association's documents prohibit borrowing money, except typically for insurance purposes. Well. This may become an emergency situation and you may have to use your emergency powers is my answer to that. Um, does a building five years old need a milestone report? The answer is yes, um, but you'll need it within 25 years of, of the date. Um, let me just give uh, some more. Um, somebody made the comment, it's only the ocean salt water, not a river or, or, or the um, or, or a lake, lake Chovy. Um, then someone asked if you have a one story garage next to a three story building, does it apply to the garage? My answer would be it applies to your entire condo if you have a three story condo. Um, I don't believe the 720 homeowners associations has the reserve uh, requirement that the, um, uh, yeah, that the it's for 718 and 719 for the reserves. Correct. Uh, not 720. Um, what happens if you've already had your 40 year certification? Too bad. Has not. Sorry, one has nothing to do with the other. They're not letting you use one for the other. Although the engineer can look at the forty-year cert and say, "Now I'm just going to update it." Right, Sammy? You can do that. Right. I, depending on how long ago the forty-year cert was conducted, you know, most engineers, if they haven't been on site in a year and a half, they're then they're going to come back. Exactly. They're going to have to come back. Uh, another question, can the engineer who's overseeing the remediation work issue the report? We, an we, we answered that one already. Okay. Uh, David, let me ask Sammy this question. So let's say the engineer comes out and you do have structural problems and you need to put a project together. And the, let's say it's going to take two years to complete the project. So you've got a report that says that there are issues that need to be addressed. Can I continue to live there? And if I can, how frequently does a report have to be updated and sent to the county or the state? that says the work is continuing on and the building's still safe. That I think we'll have, I don't recall the legislation specifying that. I could very well be wrong, um, Mr. Haber. I what I believe it is, I believe that you, as long as you have to have a report updated every six months, if there, you get a, a new report every six months and that allows you to continue on in the building. And I guess, one of the things that the county can do if they really disagree with what you're doing, they can cut the power off to the building. So ultimately they take the power out, that's gonna force everybody to move out. But as long as you they, have- they, They'll red tag you before they'll turn off the power. Yeah. They'll red tag you and send the, and they'll, and they'll send the police or the fire marshal and get you out. By the way, that red tag fine folks, they're very expensive fines. So you know, that's, you know, it's no longer the, you know, we're going to give you a, a little thousand dollar fine. There, there are thousands upon thousands of dollar fines now. Um, Barry Subcow, who I know very well, reserve specialist cannot perform the visual inspection, the structural integrity uh, reserve study. It has to be done by an engineer or an yep. architect. Um, you know, and, and, and here's the other thing that's really interesting. Reserve studies used to be for components, you know, air conditioning, um, waterproofing, painting, roof, asphalt, uh, electrical system, fire systems, uh, furniture, 
cool equipment, but they didn't have them for the actual physical structure of the building and the balconies, you know, like balcony, you know, balcony restoration. And they didn't have them for concrete columns in the garage. It was for other types of components. Can, can, can somebody talk about how that changes the game? Because now the reserves are, you know, it's like reserves just became a bigger issue. You know, it used to be, okay, you're reserving for this, you're reserving for this, you're reserving for this, but you were never really reserving for the actual structure potentially falling down or having to be completely remediated. And I think that's a huge change. Big change, Dave. A lot of people, what they used to do, David, is they used to call it into the waterproofing section. It was a waterproofing section or a painting section where it kind of got thrown in there or buried in there. But you, but you're right. It's it's something you know that I'm surprised about as well over the years. And uh, you know that's just you know one of those things that people just kind of brush to the side, thinking that we got a bunch of concrete; it's going to last forever. You know, it's you know it's one of those. Yeah, things. and now and now we're looking at it a lot differently. Yeah. Uh, let me let me answer another question. We had a building in 87. It was a rental developer refurbished it in 2004, then sold the units. My argument would be it was it's from day to CO. It's not from it's not from when he went from rental. I, I would I would take the conservative approach and have it done by 2024. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things uh, that were asked here. David wanted to know where he can get specific list of what items are considered life safety and structural components what specific work has to be fully reserved. So I think we talked about some of the components of the building that need to be covered in the reserve study. It's roofs, load bearing walls, floor, foundation, fireproofing and fire protection, plumbing, electrical systems, waterproofing, exterior paint, window components, and anything greater than $10,000 that really affects these various components. To me, it's the whole building. <laughs> it's the whole building. It used to not be that way. It is the whole building now, you know, suit and us. A couple of questions were kind of similar, but James was asking on pooled reserves. Can you have a hybrid? Can you, can you still keep pooled reserves for certain items, but on the structural, it has to be straight line? I, I, you know, I don't know how it's going to come out. I'm not into that level of detail. My partner, Jonathan Goldstein is, but I would say this. If you're going to try to do pooled, it should only be pool furniture and, and lobby furniture. I wouldn't be doing pooled reserves on any of the structural components or the MEP or the fire safety. I just wouldn't. I, I wouldn't take the chance. It isn't worth it. it. It really, it isn't worth it. It isn't worth the risk as a board member. Um, and a lot of these things haven't been, you know, some of these things haven't been fleshed out yet, you know, um, and it's going to take time. Um, it's it's uh well as, as oftentimes happens that we see when these laws pass it just creates more questions because they really don't have a lot of detail behind it and it just creates more questions mm -hmm. and over the next year or two some of these questions that we all have will become we'll get more specific answers to yeah and i think we'll get answers from the division of condominiums because they're the ones who are going to have to enforce these laws so they're going to have to come out with they're going to promulgate rules to address these questions. And, and, and the questions, by the way, are not just going to be asked by condo board members. They're going to be asked by lawyers. They're going to be asked by management companies. They're going to be asked by reserve specialists. They're going to be asked by SAMI and, and forensic engineering and architecture firms. They're going to say, look, what does this mean? Because we're not really understanding it. Um, so, so David, what, uh, Diane was asking about condo documents and whether or not uh, these new obligations need to be up, the condo docs all need to be updated with these new obligations. So we always say, put in Kaufman language. I know many of you don't know what Kaufman language is, but Kaufman was a case that basically said that you can add a couple of sentences to your declaration through amendment that basically bootstraps any changes in the law since the date of your original declaration being recorded. 
It's excellent language to protect your association for new changes to the law, to make sure that you are protected as a board and you can implement the things that are in the new law without violating your declaration. Because remember, your declaration is a contract. It's literally the constitution of your association. But you want to make sure that your constitution is updated to what's required under the law now. Otherwise, it's very hard to maneuver in today's world. And that's a very, very good point, and it helps to um, uh, adjust to these changing laws. Uh, Joanne, Joanne has an interesting comment here. She's talking about, you know, a fear of putting large amounts of money into reserves with a problem of management companies stealing the money. So that's that's kind of interesting. Management companies are are, are accountable for every dollar they spend and it's not their money. There was an issue on the west coast of Florida with a small management company that uh, did take some of their clients' money, but uh, that that's the first time I've heard of that happening. Much more often, it's the board or somebody on in the association that there's most of the fraud that exists in the state of Florida is self-managed properties, and that's where the money disappears. And, I, and I, I am a huge proponent, huge proponent, of management companies with size and strength. Individual managers, someone you hire for $80,000 because you don't wanna pay 100,000 to a company's manager to hire a company and you don't wanna pay the override fee to the company. That may cost you 5 million when that manager runs off with the money and you will never get that money back from that manager. Never, ever, ever, ever. It's not going to happen. And if they have a million dollars of insurance, it isn't going to pay the five million that's gone. You are much better off having a large, reputable management company with significant insurance behind them, experience behind them, supervision behind them, and oversight of their employees. And, you know, KW is one of those companies. Anybody that's self-managed to me in today's world is out of their minds, just completely out of their minds if they have an individual manager in today's world. And by the way, um, you know, you, you, when you put the money in the bank, you know, one of the questions that has been asked of me in the past is, uh, how do you know your money is protected, un protected under FDIC regulations when it only has like a million dollars of coverage? You can segregate it between accounts. You can segregate it between banks. Check with your management company as how to protect that money in case the bank fails, this, that, or the other. Because now we're talking about putting lots of money in the bank, not small sums of money in the bank. Um, and, you know, in some, and I don't know, you know, maybe Bruce, Bruce and Tim, you could talk about this. Should a, uh, a condo with $3 million of reserves uh, invest in, CDs laddered, laddered, meaning some are six months, some are nine months, some are a year, some are two years, as interest rates continue to rise, because while you could only get 10 basis points two years ago, if that, now, you know, for, for, for CDs, they're getting, you know, Interest, real interest. Couple Look, we could, we could talk about this. I, I think we're going to concentrate on this, but there are many different strategies that you can use. There are CEDAR programs. There are different things. When you're with, like you talk about a, a reputable management company, where, uh, for like, for example, with us, uh, you know, having exceptional accounting, one of our biggest strengths, you know, our departments are able to give you that advice that you need to have to make sure that your funds are liquid because statute says the funds have to be liquid. You can't put them in long-term investments and so forth. Uh, but those are key things, David, that, you know, I do believe that the banks uh, are going to, you know, get, you know, I'm, you know, there, those reserve accounts. And remember, reserve accounts have to be separate than operating accounts. They can't end up commingling dollars and so forth um, from that end. Uh, I think that there are very key things right now that we have to focus in on. And especially if you don't have a good, strong management company in back of you, you're going to miss a step. There are a lot of steps now, folks, that you're going to have to take to do this. And there are a lot of milestones. So that's why having a good, solid plan, being able to have milestone dates 
and, and making sure that you have those alarms going off in a sense that, hey, we're getting close to that date or let's not even get close to that date. Let's like talk about what David said is don't wait for the last minute. You got to get it in there, you know, a month before or two months before so that you're good to go and so forth. But Tim, let me throw it back to you. I think there's, there's a whole bunch of questions there that I know that people are just dying to ask or ask to answer. Well, one of the questions about funding for reserves is you, you can put your reserve funds into an interest bearing account. And it's gonna be more important than ever because you're gonna be required to actually fund so that you're gonna have much higher balances than what you've had before. Some of you've run on zero reserve balances. But let's say you're required to put $5 million in in the next 24 months. That $5 million you can put into, uh, into some interest bearing accounts and interest is going up. I just saw today that inflation was up over 9% this past month and the uh, Fed's looking at increasing uh, interest by 75 basis points or 0.75%. So that forces up interest rates that we all get for our investments that we make. Uh, I'm the treasurer of a condo that I own. And about six years ago, seven years ago, I moved a lot of the funds into accounts that were getting between 1.75 and 2.2%. At the time, that was really good. And as those renewed over the last five years, we're getting 0.1%. Now those numbers should go back up. We should be able to get back near 2%, maybe a little better. If you put it into CDs or you work with your management company, a, a reputable, effective management company will have and uh, the ability from an investment arm to give you some direction on where you can invest your money to get the best re best return while keeping your funds liquid. And I, and I would argue to the management company, use the power of your purse, because if you're representing 200 or 400 condos and you have a billion dollars of reserve money to put in banks, you have the ability to strong arm the bank to give a little bit higher interest rate to your customers, whereas an individual manager does not have that ability whatsoever. Yeah. And we're actually working on that, David. Our the KW property management clients are gonna be very happy with what we're gonna be able to bring to them from an interest standpoint, because we'll be able to do better than just somebody else walking in and giving them money. So uh, because of buying power, pure buying power gives us the ability to do that. Uh, Barry had a comment. Uh, if the condo is three stories or higher within three miles of the coastline, greater than 25 years, less than 30 years, the milestone inspection report is due by the end of this year, not by 12, 31, 24. Thank you, Barry. So in that specific instance, it's due even earlier. Um, but again, go back to the point Bruce made. Don't wait. Waiting is bad. Waiting is not a good thing when there's a limited supply of professionals and an excess demand by condo association. You do not want to be at the end of the line. And the other reason you don't want to be at the end of the line is because once these reports come out, what are all the buildings going to be required to do? Go out and get remediation contractors. So what happens if you're at the end of the line with the structural engineers or architects, then you're going to be at the end of the line with the contractors. And now you're talking about more delay, which of course is not healthy for your building because what may be a $4 million problem, by the time you're at the back of the line, it could become a $9 million problem. So the sooner you get started, believe it or not, the cheaper it will be. And uh, David, I, I promised Bruce that we'd be done by four o'clock. So we've got about six minutes left. So I wanna move to some closing comments that you all have, but first, uh, I want you to reinforce something that you said earlier, because Telk from Orlando asked a question about basically what is the responsibility or, or what, what is the consequence to the board if they don't comply with these laws? What can happen to board members? And not to, I don't want to be you know, scared straight here, but just want to be very clear that you can't ignore the law. So what would the potential consequence? I think there are criminal penalties now as well. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there are criminal penalties that have been included um, if you don't comply with the law because it's considered willful, number one. Number two, you have financial risk. There are penalties to the association and there's personal liability if something happens and goes wrong. And by the way, it doesn't have to be the building falling. It can be a piece of concrete hitting someone and killing them or maiming them. And now 
you're subject to not just a lawsuit for the association, but a personal lawsuit if someone, God forbid, is disabled because you guys didn't go get the study and, and a piece of concrete falls or a railing post falls or something happens and someone gets hurt. So you have all kinds of liability, not just for property damage, but for personal injury should something happen. And don't think some of that stuff doesn't happen because David, uh, several years ago, uh, I took over a building that was self-managed and they had chunks of concrete falling off the building. They just got, and it was right across the street from the water. They just got lucky that it didn't land on anybody. And they realized we got a big issue here. We need to address this big issue. I've had five buildings where pieces of concrete have fallen off um, or railing uh, a, a sheet of uh, a, a sheet, a pane of glass from the balcony has fallen off. Uh, we, we, I remember one we had, it fell 30 stories onto the pool deck and God forbid someone should have been on that pool deck. I mean, it would have been, it would have been instantaneous death. I mean, you know, you're talking about a huge pane of glass falling down from 30 stories. Um, so this stuff is very serious. And if you're on the board, you better take your responsibilities seriously. This, this legislation is nothing short of a huge wake up call and electric prod to condo board members to get with it or get off. And, and that being said, we don't want to scare everybody. We need board members. We still need you to be on the board, but there's a requirement that you, 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 you just have to understand that you're getting into something that's got more requirements and it's going to be, um, you're going to be watched now and you just got to do the right thing for so long the building inspectors have looked the other way and allowed you to not do the right thing in all cases. Now, if you're in Miami, Dade and Broward County, a lot of this isn't gonna be new to you because you've already been doing this in 40 year recertifications. It's just gonna happen a little bit sooner. But for the all, all the other counties in the state of Florida, this could be very new, especially if you have coastline uh, properties where most of the high rises are, you're gonna really need to comply with these laws. So pay attention to that. Uh, if I could come to you, Sammy, what is your best advice you could give and a closing comment to those listening today on these new laws? Start coming up with a plan now. <clears throat> this week alone, I've got <clears throat> eight proposals I'm sending out to do just this work. Um, and that's just me. You're working? Like, are you working six months out now? Like, how? If someone came to you and said, I need a, a, a structural engineering report, when could you get to it? Uh, at the moment, probably in a couple months. Yeah. At the, at, at best. Um, and like I said, I've, I've got several proposals going out right now. I, and that's just me. There's several other uh, people in the company that are sending out proposals as well. So this work's coming in fast and engineers are going to get slammed. We already are slammed as is outside of this new legislation. And so it's if you if you sit and wait till August of 2024, you're going to be out of luck. By the way, that's another reason to have a company like KW. If Tim picks up the phone and says, Sammy, I need a favor, he may get a favor. Mr. Hey, Smith, Mr. Smith on a, uh, in a, you know, a single property manager in the middle of Pinellas County, not going to get that kind of treatment where they can pull a favor. That's a hey good Tim, point. can can I, can I just sum it up real quickly? Please. Real quickly, establish a timeline, hire a structural engineer, sign up a reserve specialist. Make sure you have your reserve specialist in in, in order. Know your costs. This is budget season. Make sure you do good budgeting and execute your plan. If you follow those steps and those main categories that we've talked about over the last hour you're gonna be a successful association. If you don't, you're gonna have problems. Thank you. David, any final comments from your perspective? Yeah, the final comment I would make is don't forget to include your lawyer in the discussion mm -hmm. of whether or not to get a loan, a line of credit. Uh, don't go sign a letter of intent for a line of credit without your lawyer seeing it. Don't go sign loan documents. Don't sign a contract with an engineer or a contractor without having your lawyer negotiate it and review it. 
because then you're just creating a mess for yourselves later when the lawyer says, why did you sign that contract? Well, I was in a rush to get it done because Haber told me we got to get it done now. Well, <laughs> yeah, you got to get it done now, but you got to have the right contract. So I would say, make sure your lawyer's in that process and time is not on your side here, people. It's not. So get moving. That's my final comment. Get moving. In closing, I want to review the poll questions real quick. 51% of the respondents said that they understand the new legal requirements of the milestone inspections and the more detailed phase two structural inspection. So only 51% means they're, and I'd say half of those people probably don't really understand it, but it, it, that's, uh, th th that's a big number. Is your property within three miles of the coastline? 66% of the people on this call said yes. Is your property at least 25 years old? 65% said yes. Have you had a reserve study completed in the past two years? 43% said yes. Uh, and uh, do you understand the requirements to properly fund your reserves for structural integrity engineering report? 62% uh, uh, said yes. So this conversation today is very useful. I will tell you that this is recorded. Everybody on this call and anybody who signed up and didn't join us today will get a recorded uh, webinar of this of today's session and please share it with your board members watch it again if you think there's value that you need to get from this but in my closing comments I do want to say uh, the conversation today was great if an hour has gone by panelists you guys were terrific thank you so much we hope that all the listeners got some clarity on the new laws requiring milestone inspections structural inspections and structural reserve studies uh, my big takeaway is that, don't wait. You, you just can't, don't wait to start funding reserves. Don't wait to engage an engineering firm. Start now, go find somebody that can do it if you haven't already got a, re a, a valid report already completed. So get started sooner and later. I thank all of the hundreds of people that signed up for today's session. Uh, it is recorded, as I mentioned. You can find it on our YouTube channel at KWPM TV, and I'll email it to everybody that signed up. I want to sincerely thank uh, our panelists today David Haber, founder of Haber Law, Sammy Haddam, project manager with Epic Forensic and Engineering, and Bruce Mejia, vice president for KW Property Management. Thank you. You guys were all fantastic. Um, from all of us at KW Property Management Consulting, be kind to your neighbor follow your association rules, and stay healthy. Thank you all, and have a great afternoon. Bye, everybody. Bye now. Great day.